everyone. My name is Karim Saeed. I am professor of cardiology in Cairo University. I have the pleasure to be with you today in the Egyptian Society of Cardiology Review course. I am going to discuss uh, what I think it is an important but missed item in the field of cardiology. I am going to talk about the cardiovascular syndromes that have a genetic disorders. I am going to go through uh, in a simple way. Um, I hope you will enjoy this lecture. I will start with Down syndrome. Down syndrome, as we know, it is a genetic disorder characterized by the presence of three copies of the chromosome 21. So it is a 21 trisomy. And in half of this population, we will find a congenital heart disease. And as a revision, as we know, Down syndrome is characterized by specific dysmorphic features. Uh, those individuals tend to have an epicanthus fold and protruded tongue with mental retardation. They have low set ear and they have a transverse crease in the middle of their palm among other diagnostic features. And from the cardiovascular point of view, uh, the most important uh, congenital anomaly found in this population is AV canal. It is found in 43% of those who are going to have a congenital heart disease. The second most common defect is ventricular septal defect. And in 10% of those affected, they tend to have an atrial septal defect. Other malformations include teratology of fallow, patent ductus arteriosus, and other regions may include aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitations. An important feature in the congenital heart disease among patients with Down syndrome is their tendency to develop pulmonary hypertension early and the progressive. So any patients with Down syndrome should be screened for the presence of congenital heart disease, especially the presence of AV canal. And once we detect this defect, we should be very cautious about the development of pulmonary hypertension and the development of Eisenmenger syndrome. The second interesting disorder is the Noonan syndrome. Noonan syndrome, it is an abnormalities in a gene that mediate a metabolic pathway. It is the RAS mitogen activated protein kinase pathway. The number of chromosomes is normal in contrast to those of Down syndrome and it is an autosomal dominant defect. So if a patient is going to have an offspring, there is a chance of 50% of this spring to have a similar defect. An important feature also in Noonan syndrome is that up to 80% of those population will have one or more of congenital heart disease. What are the features of Noonan syndrome? They have a very peculiar features. They have a triangular face, coarse facial features, ptosis, downward slanting of both eyes, high Bartolorism, low set ears, micrognathia, and they have deformity at the chest. They have a whipped neck. This is important because they share this feature with Turner syndrome. Actually, it is called a male Turner syndrome. They tend to have a hypospedius and descendant testicles. Another syndrome which is closely related to Noonan syndrome is the Leopard syndrome. It is also an autosomal dominant defect. Mutations occur at the same locus and gene in the detected in Noonan syndrome. And it is characterized by presence of seven features. Patient may have majority of these features. Patients tend to have a freckles or lentigenesis in their skin. So it is called Leobard, Leobard syndrome. It is called Noonan syndrome with lentigenesis. ECG conduction abnormalities, ocular hypertolerism, pulmonary stenosis, similar to Noonan syndrome, as we're going to mention, abnormal genitalia, gross retardation, and deafness. Back to Noonan syndrome, as we mentioned, up to 80% of those patients will have one or more of congenital heart disease. The most common 
that may be detected and in up to third of these affected uh, population is the presence of pulmonary stenosis with displa dysplastic leaflet. And accordingly, they resist balloon dilation. And the only solution for severe pulmonary stenosis in these patients is surgery. A characteristic in their ECG in the presence of pulmonary stenosis is the presence of left axis deviation. In 20% of those patients, they will have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And as, I'm, as we are going to discuss later on, Noonan syndrome is one of the differential diagnoses in patients with significant left ventricular hypertrophy. Up to 10% of these patients will have a secundum atrial septal defect. The next syndrome is the Turner syndrome. In Turner syndrome, there is missing of an X from one chromosome, so it will affect only female, and they tend to have a 45 chromosome plus a single X chromosome. Congenital abnormalities occurs in 25 to 45% of these affected females. We know the uh, characteristic features for Turner syndrome. Of course, this is a female with a short stature and a webbed neck similar to Noonan syndrome, low hairline, small chin, prominent ears, broad chest with widely spaced, uh, spaced nibble. They have a cubitus valgus when we examine the elbow uh, angle. And they have primary amenorrhea. I, and they lose the uh, female sexually, sexually uh, features. The most important congenital uh, malformation from the cardiovascular point of view in these patients is the presence of bicuspid aortic valve. The second most common disorder is co-architation of the aorta. Also, they have aortic stenosis, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, aortic aneurysm, one to 2% of these patients will have aortic dissection, and up to 50% of these patients will have systemic arterial hypertension. Another interesting syndrome, it is the Williams syndrome. Williams syndrome, it is a genetic def defect due to microdeletion in a band in a chromosome number seven related to the elastine gene. And it is an autosomal dominant uh, disorder. However, the majority uh, of this population will acquire this syndrome as a mutation. Only in 25% of the affected individual, they will have a family history. Up to 80% of patients with Williams syndrome will have one or more associated congenital heart disease. They have a very peculiar facies. It is called an elfin facies. What is an elfin facies? First, they have small head. 30% of these patients will have a small head. They have a prominent forehead, flat, depressed nasal bridge, a, a tip of the nose that points upward, a long philtrum, a, a, a very uh, large mouth, so it is uh, like uh, a smile mouse. Small chin, micrognathia. So the classic Williams syndrome is easily to be detected. However, we have a wide uh, phenotypic variation of this syndrome. They are very funny individual. They are very friendly. Uh, they like music. They have an artistic uh, sense. They uh, do not like uh, the loud voices. Uh, some mental retardation can be detected in many uh, of those affected individuals. However, some may have a normal mentality in adult. The abnormality usually in the medium and the large-sized arteries. They have to tend a diffuse or local stenosis. So, among others, the most important defect is supravalvular aortic stenosis. Uh, 
at the junction between the sinus of Valsalva and the tubular ascending aorta. It tends to be stationary, rarely to be progressive. Another stenosis involves the pulmonary arteries. So it is a right-sided obstructive lesion. So we have a left-sided obstructive lesion and we have a right-sided obstructive lesion. Hypertension is so common among this individual because of the stenosis in different parts of the arteries and also due to the presence of renal artery stenosis. They tend to have a hypercalcemia and hypercalcemia may be a cause for severe valvular aortic stenosis. So they have supravalvular and a tendency for valvular aortic stenosis. These patients do not tolerate anesthesia or procedural intervention well. They may die suddenly during anesthesia or during any vascular intervention due to many factors. So this should be taken very cautiously to do vascular or cardiac intervention among those individuals. Marfan syndrome, of course. This is a very well recognized syndrome. There is a genetic mutation in the long arm of chromosome 15. In the genes that encode, this is the fibrin gene that encodes the synthesis of fibrin. And the fibrin is an integral component of the microfibrils. And the microfibrils involve the synthesis of the sheath that surrounds the elastin fiber. Some patients will have a defect in tissue growth factor beta pathway. The reported incidence of Marfan syndrome is one for every five to 10,000 cases. The majority of cases up to 70% are hereditary. However, 30% may be due to new mutations. They have a well-characterized uh, features. We know the musculoskeletal features, they tend to have a tall stature, an arm span that exceeds the height. Also, they have a long digit, and this can be detected by two signs. The thumb sign in which the distal phalanx of the thumb protrudes beyond the border of the clenched fist. And the red sign in which the thumb and the fifth digit overlap when surround the rest. This is not the norm in individuals without Marfan syndrome. They tend to have sternal deformity and scoliosis, significant scoliosis, and joint hypermobility. I is an important culprit in patients with Marfan syndrome. They tend to have a superior lens dislocation, which is ectopia lentis. This is detected by slit lamp. Another syndrome which share many features with Marfan syndrome is homocystinuria. And in this syndrome with similar skeletal malformation, the lens dislocation this time is inferior and not superior. We have pulmonary complication in the blood vessel and in the lung, including spontaneous pneumothorax. Neurological complications, including dural ectasia and stretch marks. For the cardiovascular involvement in patients with Marfan syndrome, aortic root disease involving the ascending part of the aorta is very peculiar. Also presence of dissection, acute dissection is characteristics. Both may occur in up to 50% of children and up to 80% of adults. Mitral valve prolapse, which is a minor criterion in patients with Marfan syndrome, is detected in up to 80% of patients. We have against criteria that we can use to diagnose Marfan syndrome. And as we can see, cardiovascular system involvement contribute to the diagnosis by giving some major and some minor criteria. Major criteria will include dilation of the ascending aorta, with or without aortic regurgitation, strict to the sinus of Valsalva, and may be complicated with aortic dissection. Minor criteria will include mitral valve prolapse, mitral annual calcification at age below 40, pulmonary artery dilation, and dilation 
plus or minus dissection involving the descending aorta below the age of 50. So descending aorta also may be involved in patients with Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome occupies a specific uh, corner in our management in patients with uh, uh, aortic aneurysm. The standard for intervention for patients without genetic disorder and Marfan syndrome when they develop ascending aortic aneurysm is when the dimension is at least 55 millimeter. However, the cutoff for patients with Marfan syndrome is 45 millimeter, not 55, because the risk for dissection is high. And this is important in patients with specific high risk feature for the development of dissection. This will include a family history of aortic dissection. This will also include a progressive increase of the aortic size by more than three millimeter per year. Also the presence of severe aortic or mitral regurgitation will constitute an important risk factor. And in a female patient who is going to have a pregnancy, we should operate in the ascending aorta if it is just exceed the four millimeter, 45 millimeter cutoff. Now we will go to some syndromes that involve the atrial septum itself. We have two syndromes, one autosomal dominant and the other is autosomal recessive. The first autosomal dominant syndrome, it is called the Holt or Ram syndrome. It is characterized by involvement of the radial aspect of the upper limb, starting from the thumb up to the shoulder. So we may have a hypoplastic thumb that characterized by the presence of three instead of two phalanx. The thumb, it may be rudimentary or absent as we can see at the lower picture. The radius may be hypoplastic and this can be detected by X-ray or even absent. Those patients have uh, ostium secundum ASD. The other autosomal recessive syndrome is called the Ellis Van Creveld syndrome. It is characterized by near absence of the interatrium septum or the presence of common atrium. There is dwarfism and the polydactyly in all affected individual of the hand, polydactyly of the feet in 10% of the affected individual, and the nails are hypoplastic. They are characterized by having multiple frenula in their upper lip. Now to the most common genetic uh, abnormalities among patients with cardiac muscle disease. That is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The reported incidence prevalence is one for every 500 individual. However, recent data denote a higher prevalence for such genetic disorder. And it is responsible for the majority of sudden cardiac deaths in young individual, especially during sporting. From the genetic aspect of view, it has a very important some important features. First, it is an autosomal dominant. So the risk to transmit this disorder to the offspring is about 50%. It has a high penetrance. High penetrance means that it will manifest in the coming generation. It will not miss any generation. The lifetime risk for developing phenotypic hokum is very high. However, it has a variable phenotype. We may have obstructive or non-obstructive cardiomyopathy. We may have a mild versus severe cardiomyopathy. And the clinical expression increase with age. However, it starts at adulthood. We have many genes involved in the development of hokum. All are sarcomeric genes. And in 50% of these mutations were characterized. Other 50% are under research. The most common mutation detected in 40% of uh, affected individual is mutation in the cardiac myosin binding 
protein C. Other include beta myosin heavy chain mutations or uh, cardiac troponin. When we look to the differential diagnosis of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, we will have a hokum, but we'll have also other uh, metabolic genetic disorder. This will include Fabry disease, Danone disease, and the Burkage to cardiomyopathy. We have also some syndromic disorder, including Noonan syndrome and Yerubar syndrome. Remember, we have discussed these two disorders uh, before. Now I'm going to go through the Fabry's disease, Danone disease, and the Burkage cardiomyopathy. What is Fabry's disease? It is an X-linked important error of metabolism related to deficiency of alpha-galactosidase A enzyme responsible in sphingolipid metabolism. X-linked, so it tends to affect males. However, some female may have some features of Fabry's disease. The most important thing, it can be diagnosed by doing enzyme assay in the plasma or leukocytes or in biopsy tissue, and it has treatment by providing replacement therapy. Sphingolipid will deposit in many tissues, including the cardiomyocytes, causing hypertrophy, diastolic and systolic dysfunction in the endothelium, so it affects the coronaries, the kidneys, the cerebrum, and also it deposits in the valves. So we have a very wide phenotypic, phenotypic expression of Fabry's disease. The most common involvement site is the heart in about 70% 70, 70 of individuals. They tend to have card hypertrophic like cardiomyopathy. Peripheral neuropathy in 50% of individuals. Renal failure in 50%. Corneal opacities in 40%. Skin lesions, we'll discuss this. Multiple strokes and the involvement in the GIT. The angiokeratoma corporis is one of the features of Fabry's disease. These lesions, as we can see, involve what is called the passing area of the body. This involves the groin, the patok, the umbilicus, and the upper thigh. However, any part of the body can be involved. In the cardiovascular system, Fabry's disease will cause or will be associated with systemic hypertension, unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy, cardiac dysrhythmias and the conduction defect, valvular heart disease and mitral regurgitation, vasculopathies involving the coronaries, ischemic heart disease, and increase the risk for sudden cardiac death. Fabry's disease should be considered in any patients with unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy. And in any patients with HOCM, given the diagnosis of HOCM, also we should consider Fabry's. Actually, 1% of patients labeled as being HOCM actually have Fabry's disease. And among patients with unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy, 4% will have Fabry's disease. Also, Fabry's disease is a cause for restrictive cardiomyopathy. The other syndrome is the Danone disease. Danone disease is an X-linked recessive, such similar to Fabry's, in which there is a storage of a glycogen inside the cell due to def defect in enzyme called lysosomal associated membrane protein kinase that is responsible for the entry of material to lysosome to be degraded. In muted cell, this enzyme is deficient. It is characterized by massive cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, rarely to be obstructive. Also, there is skeletal myopathy involving the upper and the lower limbs. So, Creatine kinase is high in this individual, and they have short PR, pre-excitation pattern. It is not WBW syndrome, it is a pre-excitation because they don't have excess risk for arrhythmias. So the classic feature of Danone syndrome is a male with severe left ventricular hypertrophy, with short PR and the elevated CK. 
Female may have a mild form of the disease, and we have a phenotypic variant of the disease that manifests as a dilated cardiomyopathy. Barkash 2 syndrome is a mutation in uh, AMP activated protein kinase. It is an autosomal dominant. Also, it has left ventricular hypertrophy, short PR, tendency for supraventricular arrhythmias, and increased risk for uh, chronotropic incompetence and the development of heart block. So when we have a male with a family history of sudden cardiac death or cardiac hypertrophy in a autosomal dominant pattern in young age with a short PR interval, tendency for bradycardia, we should think on Percage 2 syndrome. Another form of genetic cardiomyopathy is arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. As we know, this is a defect in the desmosomes. Many uh, genes in the uh, formation of desmosome. And it tends to be an autosomal dominant. However, we have two genetic syndrome with autosomal recessive features, the Nexus disease and the Carvajal syndrome. The Nexus disease, uh, Nexus is islands in uh, Greece, and this syndrome is uh, prevalent there, one for every 1,000 inhabitants in the Greece islands. And it is characterized by arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia features, plus woolly hair and the keratosis at the palm of the hand and sole of the feet. The Carvajal syndrome is a variant of an axis, but with involvement of the left side of the heart. Another disorder is the hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, the osler weber rindu syndrome. It is an autosomal dominant disease characterized by the presence of telangiectasia and the risk of bleeding all over the body. And it is due to mutations in the transferring growth factor beta. We have telangiectasia, we have epistaxis, GIT bleeding, pulmonary AV malformation, cerebral AV malformation, and hepatic mal AV malformation. And these patients tend to have telangiectasia in any mucous membrane. So we should search for this telangiectasia at the lips and at the tongue, as we can see, as this may be the only clue for the presence of this uh, syndrome. Pulmonary AV malformation in the majority of cases are asymptomatic. However, in one third of patients, they will, they will show sign of right to left shunt, and this will manifest as cyanosis and polycythemia. Some patients who may develop pulmonary hemorrhage, especially in pregnancy. And in patients who have AV malformation in the liver, there is a high likelihood for the development of high output heart failure, left-sided and right-sided heart failure. And there is association in these gene mutations and the development of the hereditary type of pulmonary arterial hypertension. The last syndrome I am going to discuss in this presentation is the familial hypercholesterolemia. We have till now four known genes for this disorder. The first gene, which is the first mutations involve the LDL receptor. And it is responsible for more than 95% of all cases. And we have more than 1,700 mutations. The other mutation in ApoP proteins, minorities involving the basic S9 genes and the LDL receptor related protein, associated protein. In all these mutations, there is loss of function except in the P69 mutations, and all are of autosomal dominant nature except for the LDL receptor associated protein. There is tendency for the deposition of cholesterol even in utero, in all vascular tissues and in subcutaneous tissues as well. So there will be stenosis at the large and in medium-sized arteries, the coronaries, the cerebrum, the renal, 
However, the ascending part of the aorta also will be a seat for deposition of cholesterol, and this will lead to supravalvular aortic stenosis, which is very common among those individuals. So in any patient with suspected familial hypercholesterolemia, we should ask for echo for the presence of supravalvular aortic stenosis. And of course, we have multiple form of xanthomas and zelasmas in those patients. We have arcus uh, juvenilis in the cornea, which is a basognomonic, one of the diagnostic feature in FH when occur in young age. Sickening of the tendon Achilles, that this can be detected either clinically or by X-ray. We have xanthelasmas. It is not basognomonic for familial hypercholesterolemia, but it did not increase the risk. Also, we can find deposition that may reach a large size at the elbows and the knees. Finally, before ending this presentation, this is a Mona Lisa. This uh, young lady died at the age of 37. And multiple diagnoses were given to explain why she died at this early age. One of these diagnoses was familial hypercholesterolemia. We have this uh, deposition at the inner aspect of the nose that may denote xanthelasmas, and we have this swelling at uh, the rest that may denote xanthoma. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and thank you for your attention.